everyone. I'm Lynn Shepherd, Director of the Masood Entrepreneurship Centre, and I'd like to welcome you all to Entrepreneurs at Manchester. We want to inspire and encourage our students and graduates to become the next generation of entrepreneurs within existing businesses or by creating their own, changing the world and making a difference. And today we're fortunate to be joined by one of our graduates, Andrew Jervis, co-founder of Click Mechanic. After studying management and organization with politics at Lancaster University, Andrew was accepted onto the Master of Enterprise postgraduate degree program here at the University of Manchester. And it was during this time that Andrew really developed his entrepreneurial mindset. He was vice president of Manchester Entrepreneurs and established two startups, Jedward and Pie Boy Clothing. He received a distinction on the MN program and was then accepted onto the 2012 Entrepreneur First cohort. I can't believe that that's actually 10 years ago. In 2013, his startup Click Mechanic won the technology category of our venture further competition. And he was presented with a check for 10,000 pounds at the awards presentation dinner in May, 2013. Click Mechanic is an online car repair and servicing business where you can get a fair price in seconds, mechanics you can trust, a next day service at your door, really changing the model of traditional car servicing. And of course, in 2021, Andrew won the 2021 award for Small Business Entrepreneur of the, year, of the Year. And I really want to congratulate him on that. There will be an opportunity for Andrew to also answer your questions. So please do post them in the chat. But let me begin by first asking, Andrew, how, how has your educational experience influenced your entrepreneurial journey? And then tell us more about the highlights of your startup story. Hey, Lynn, uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess, uh, how has my kind of education uh, molded my entrepreneurial journey and what impact has it had? Uh, I'd say pretty, pretty significant, to be honest. I think prior to uh, joining the MN course, I, I definitely had an appetite for wanting to start my own businesses and, and so on, but I was very much kind of trial and error trying things learning as i went and i learned a lot but the ability and the the opportunity to come onto the course and kind of learn lots of different frameworks uh, that you could apply practically to kind of building and developing startups companies i think was super super valuable uh but not just that not just the sort of academic side and the, the learning those types of things the I guess the ecosystem in Manchester was really big for myself as well. Was, uh, moving to Manchester is the first time uh, I'd been in a, a big city um, and lived in a big city. So I jumped straight in. As you mentioned, I kind of got involved with the Entrepreneur Society, which I ultimately became vice president of um, and joined. Uh, at the time, there was um, a small business uh, office space called InnoSpace in the centre. Uh, I don't think it's there any longer, but I joined that, met lots of other kind of young entrepreneurs who were just starting out on their journey. Some of them were at the University of Manchester, some were at uh, Man Met, some had just recently graduated. So having that ecosystem was super valuable and sharing those experiences, but also having that kind of more formal training around looking at uh, whether it was the business model canvas or whatever it may be, um, um, or the lean startup and, and so on. I think those are really valuable books and frameworks to learn that I could apply and then be much more confident about, about building Oh, starting click mechanic so what, what about what about the softer aspects of your business startup one of the things i remember andrew i mean i remember you when you were when you were a student here in in, in manchester and and i can remember when you were um launching pie boy clothing um you and the others in your team would be serenading people with guitars on oxford road do you remember that yeah and that of course got picked up and that got picked up by the university media services. And I remember even um, the university president um, was interested in that. And I think you even um, sent uh, some clothing to, um, to, our, to, our, to our president, um, Professor Dame Nancy Rothwell, who I'm sure will remember you, Andrew. So how important were those kind of the softer aspects? I suppose that the, the marketing, the media, the social media, the branding, how important was that in your journey? 
Uh, yeah, again, incredibly important. Important. I mean, these are all facets, uh, whether it's marketing or media, that that contribute to to building a great company. Uh, there's a whole whole range of different skills uh, that you need, and uh, they're incredibly important. I think when you, as well, when you talk about the softer aspects, um, I think yeah, building it can be really underrated, like building relationships and building team morale and culture. And these are things I'm only um, kind of later on during the journey in the journey so we're like 30 people now but you you kind of really start to appreciate how important that is in the early days it you, you kind of just kind of do it and it just kind of happens but those softer skills are just incredibly important and uh yeah and and meeting yeah uh dame nancy was uh it was this was amazing and um yeah she was a massive advocate for us and a big supporter and yeah and it made made it worthwhile all those days uh going around and um yeah making some crazy videos and stuff but if you if you look on youtube now manchester's gorgeous girl you will uh i think there's there's quite a few views on that you'll see some of the some of the guerrilla marketing we were doing back then and it, and it definitely helped and it's still there is it yeah it is yeah if you uh wow. if you look on the pie boy clothing youtube channel there's a few videos on there that yeah i've got a few views and we were doing some quite quite fun stuff back in the day which uh yeah, yeah people really rallied behind and enjoyed it so, uh, Andrew, when did when did you realise that Click Mechanic um, offered up a really interesting and uh, viable business idea that you could put all of your efforts behind? When did you realise that? Was it because I think your MA dissertation was in the area of automotive, um, and you got a distinction for that? When did you realise on your journey that it was going to be something you wanted to put hundred percent of your effort into? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, so I think during my master's, I was definitely dead set on not wanting to go down like the corporate career route and really wanted to try and, um, yeah, to go down the entrepreneurial, um, entrepreneurial route. And, uh, we're having quite a lot of success with my, my whole dissertation was around the, the car repair experience and how a lot of consumers disliked it and models to help, help alleviate that. But while build like, essentially writing that thesis and doing all that research i was also running pie boy and we, we, we had a reasonable amount of success with that we started um doing pop-up stalls and selling the, the bobble hats which then led to winning um some contracts at the university of manchester with man met and sheffield and some other universities um so we were kind of um yeah so i was to be honest i was dead set on taking pie boy forward um um at the same time i applied towards the end of my uh masters i applied to a tech accelerator called entrepreneur first which was just getting just spun out of mckinsey consulting just getting launched in london um so i was very fortunate to go through all their different application uh, steps and uh, their interview day and stuff and ultimately I, we had to pitch at, at the time an idea um and I wanted to bring uh, Pie Boy uh, clothing to the to the program, um, and they basically the whole ethos behind the program was it was going to be high high tech and uh, building tech startups, and they felt that that was kind of too fashion orientated. Um, but did I have another idea I could bring? And I was like, well, I'm actually writing my whole thesis around around the uh, the automotive repair space and looking at building a marketplace for it, and it's something I'm really passionate about as well. And they were like, that's that would be ideal. So it was, uh, I was left with a really tough decision. Do I kind of pursue Pie Boy and stay in Manchester or do I move to London and pursue this other idea I'm really excited about uh, with Entrepreneur First? Um, so I was fortunate enough that at the time I um, was working with some people on Pie Boy and um, one of my colleagues took that forward like full time and I moved to London, uh, initially sleeping on a friend's couch, um, joining the, the Entrepreneur First. Uh, tech accelerator program and then and throwing myself into that so I think it was I guess the the decision point came from entrepreneur first really and um and having to really focus on tech and and but well, there was a whole heap of stuff leading up to that I wanted to also ask you because I think this might come back to the entrepreneur first experience as well I mean you're your co-founder co of click mechanic and I think the well the ethos behind entrepreneur first is that um, they like um, businesses to be started by two people. They mm -hmm. like co-founders. Um, they don't. They don't like three people, and they don't like one person. It seems like two is the magic number for Entrepreneur First. 
Is that where you, you met your co-founder to take Click Mechanic forward? Yeah, exactly, 100%. So, um, yeah, um, so I think over the years, the, 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 well, not the kind of their learnings have evolved and they've, they've tweaked the program a little bit. But when um, I first joined the program, they were very much about finding different people with different skill sets and, and they would call them like hustlers and hackers. And I guess I was, I was the hustler guy. I could do some <laughs> of the marketing and sales. And then my co-founder I met on the program, Felix, was a computer scientist, incredibly smart guy. Um, he'd studied computer science at Imperial, had done a master's there as well. Um, and he graduated top of his class. He'd been developing apps, a really entrepreneurial guy, but obviously a very different skill set. And we both believed in the, the the problem space, and we believed there was a better way of doing it. Um, so yeah, we 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 teamed up, and yeah, we had two really complementary skills. It was you know, exactly where Felix's blind spots are. I'm, that's my strengths, and vice versa. Um, you know, I he's just amazing when it comes to the coding and all that type of things, and that's not not an area I excel at. So uh, yeah, so that that's where we met, and that that was that's how it worked. Yeah. That's really interesting. So would you, would your advice to people that are thinking of starting out now um, to, to to look very positively about, you know, taking ideas forward with a co-founder to working alongside someone to, to, to take an idea to the next stage? Yeah, what well, 110% uh, without a shadow of a doubt. I mean, starting a business is incredibly hard by itself and you just have to look at it a lot. The failure rates are really, really high. So you just have starting something and, and doing it with someone where you're equal footing, you have the same equity stake, you have the same level of emotional investment, financial investment, I think is absolutely the way to do it. Um, and it means, and as, as well, doing it with somebody who has complementary skill sets is, is really incredibly important as well, similar to us. And it, it just means you can share that you know, emotional way, that you can share the responsibility, you have someone you can lean on. Um, and yeah, I previously in the past, I started uh, some ventures by myself and it, it's de definitely a different journey. It's, it, I think it is more challenging. Um, uh, and I would definitely advocate for starting something with a, with a co-founder. It has its own challenges because obviously you spend a lot of time with that person and it's almost like a, a marriage um, without all the other bits. Uh, you spend a lot of time with them. So, um, yeah, they, they can be, you know, you have to find your way and find the best way to work together. But um, if you can, it, it definitely pays huge dividends. I was going to ask you where, where your drive and motivation comes from. And I suppose also that also is another question that brings Felix into this as well. You know, is he a help with, with that in terms of your drive and motivation? Or do you find you're quite, um, you know, you're quite unique in the way that you address your own uh, motivations? Uh, yeah, I, th I think as a start, my, I probably have quite motivated myself. Um, yeah, for on a number of for a number of different reasons, probably probably some of them are deeply rooted psychological reasons. But no, I, I'm definitely very very proactive and very uh, motivated myself to to build things, do things. Um, I have worked. For other organizations like in a, a corporate environment in the past and done my own stuff but i, I definitely favor uh, doing my own thing um but yeah in, insofar as does having a co-founder like help with that motivation as well yeah 100 percent. because you know not everyone not anybody is going to have those days where they every day is going to be a good day right you're going to have your challenging days and you know hopefully those challenging days you're you're co-founder can kind of pick you up and, and vice versa so um yeah it's i think um yeah that intrinsic motivation is incredibly important um and i think when you you start a business it's it's a big commitment it's a, it can be easily you know, we've been going at this 10 years now and in one regard you know it, it kind of feels like it's still in its infancy in another regard if you told me 10 years ago we'd be where we are now i'd be like wow that's really impressive so it's a massive commitment so yeah you have to um you have to realize up front and have that motivation that like, I could be doing this for 5, 10, 15, 20 years um, if you want to make a big success of it. Um, so, yeah. So what, push, what pushes you forward, Andrew, through difficult times? Uh, because they're always difficult times, even if, even if they are 
you know, difficult with a small D rather than a capital D. Yeah, you know, yeah. what pushes you forward through those through those times? What gets you what gets you going through them? Um, like a whole host of different factors, really. Like some of it is down to right, really wanting to disrupt a category and and solve a problem and make a lot of people's lives easier. And a whole vision is about making car care easy for everyone everywhere. And um, yeah, like when you look at just currently, if you look at the the stats of people booking car repairs on the internet, it's about 1%. So yeah, we are as a category just getting started. Um, so yeah, that's a huge motivation. Um, but also I, I guess like a, a fear of failure as well. You know, you, you, you set out to do something and achieve something and you know, failure is not a bad thing. It's a learning opportunity, but I think you know, it's still no one wants to fail so you just work extra hard especially in the early days we'd work crazy hours uh seven days a week really just to make sure that we we could scrap and survive and and get the business established um so i think yeah there's so in short i think it's a you know there's a a real kind of visionary motivation of where you want to get to but then equally there's a there's a kind of a position right now of like we can't fail we need to do this and, and that's probably another short-term driver you could say so you're at a kind of interesting point really in, in, in your growth now 10 years um and and i know that your answer to this will be yes um innovation continual innovation is important um i'm sure you'd say yes so where, where do you see yourselves on that traditional s-shaped curve of, of of a business growth um and 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 where do you feel you're going next? Do you think you are looking at the next challenges um, around, you know, technology, you know, the, the, the way we approach, the way we, um, the way we live our lives? What, what's the next challenge for you? Uh, yeah, so I think as, a, as an organization, um, yeah, I think we're still kind of at the, almost at the beginning of the, ho like not the beginning of the hockey stick, but um, you yeah, know, we're on that hockey stick and we're, probably relatively low down on the curve of relative to where we want to get this business to be. I mean, we want Clint Mechanic to be around for 50, hundred years and like be a, a real big brand name that people recognize and, and so on. So um, yeah. And the, and the life cycle of Clint Mechanic is still probably quite early on. Um, and in terms of your, the second part of your question, sorry, was. Well, just in terms of how you are planning for the next you know, you know, you, yeah. we've got a good idea of what the next four or five years are going to be like. Well, we think we have a good, a reasonable idea. But, you know, are you looking at the next 10 years? Are you really beginning to start future scoping now for your business? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, yeah, it's a good question. So we we don't get so we have like a vision and a mission and we have some like sort of middle long term aspirations of where we want it to get the business to. But they are quite often they're aspirational to to be able to predict what you're know, doing financial models like what revenue are we going to be doing in you know, two years is hard enough like five years is almost impossible right so um i think it's like yeah a case of like having these aspirational goals of where you want to uh, get to and a vision and and some values that back the business but what what's a really important planning cadence for us is quarters like you a quarter like a month is like a relatively or a week or a month is you can get stuff done, but it's a relative short period of time. A quarter is like there's three months there where you can really do something and have some meaningful impact towards that vision. So we're we're big into the quarters and we use a framework called um they're called OKRs, objectives and key results. So first, uh you probably might be aware of them, like Intel first um kind of came up with them uh god like maybe 10, 15 years ago. And and I guess Google have popularized them. So now they're they're kind of becoming more widespread where you kind of set down set your company objectives and then some key results of so the objective will be uh it, it can be a little bit more soft but your key results have to be hard numbers of, of what you want to achieve what's what's the key result and then what we do is every quarter we will as a leadership team we'll get together set our company objectives and key results even for the year and then each quarter and then we kind of present them to the teams and then each team sets their own objectives and key results and they all cascade cascade down from the company ones. And yeah, I think if you've if you set your kind of vision and where you want to get to, and we have we have four key strategic pillars that um, and that we believe in is the future of our space. 
and the team's aware of that. And then we set these quarterly objectives and key results. Then each quarter, the team set their own objectives, key results they want to achieve. And basically quarter by quarter, you'll, you'll be making, you'll be making progress towards that, that longer term vision. Um, and then we even have like to, with the objectives, we have uh, weekly kind of confidence scoring. So each team on their objectives and key results, they'll score how confident they are to meet their quarterly objectives. And it's just like a big, big framework and it all kind of cascade, cascades down, you could say. I'm, I'm, I'm really so pleased that, uh, that, that you've elucidated that because it, it's exactly what, if you think back, you think back to when you did your MN, you think back then, even using those, you know, even using basic models then, you were looking at planning something. You had no idea what the potential was, but you were trying to put together, you know, a Gantt chart and you were trying to put together, you know, plans um, for the next five years. I think your financial plans in your MN dissertation had to be around at, at least three years, if not five years. And so, yeah, I think, uh, I don't think that learning has, uh, has gone to waste. Um, I, I mean, I honestly, Andrew, I could I could talk to you all all, all all evening about this and reminisce about things. But let let me ask you, um, you know, what advice would you give to um, you know our students or early stage graduates listening to this? What advice would you give them if they were interested in taking an idea forward as a startup? Wow, uh, the key the yeah. key piece of advice, the most yeah, the advice. most important. Um, I think founding a business is like, there's obviously a high degree of risk there in terms of like a failure and, and something that happened. So first of all, you have to have a level of commitment there that this is going to be you know, something I'm going to need to really invest a lot of time and effort into. However, when I say commitment, that doesn't necessarily mean financial commitment. Sometimes you You'll see up your watch on Dragon's Den. They're like, oh, okay, how, how much have you put into this? Your own money, and they'll be like, oh, hundred thousand. It's like what? <laughs> so, I, so although there's although there's like there's a high degree of failure, you call it failure. Failure is just another means to learning. There is you can de-risk a lot of things you do. So, Clint Mechanic, the, the I think Felix and myself have both invested about five pounds into it. Now it's to buy the domain. Um, then we got free, like we got a free fifty pounds AdWords AdWords voucher. We got some free hosting. We we basically haven't invested any of our own money in. But what we did was we used a framework um, that we kind of learned from the Lean Startup, which was a book I first read on the MN, uh, which is all about kind of iterative kind of learning and 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 yeah. feeding that back in. So it's about having those feedback loops and learning and building and testing and and so on and that, that's still something we do all the time today um so i would definitely suggest reading the lean startup um and yeah i would i would definitely think about is this if you really want to make it a success is this something i could really see myself kind of building and doing for five or ten years and am i am i ready to commit to that because if you're not if you're not really to, to kind of really commit, then it still can be fun to do a lifestyle business and do something on the side, but it will be really hard to make it like a big success. Um, so those would be those would be a, a couple of couple of nuggets. There's probably plenty more, but uh, yeah, those would be a couple of things I'd suggest. So the other thing is, um, Andrew, what what help? What what was the most important piece of help? Uh, did you? Although it probably doesn't make any grammatical sense. What what help did you get when you were starting out? What was the most important? thing that helped you at the start I mean it clearly wasn't it clearly wasn't it it was some of the free money that you got from, from, from various whether it's competitions or or whatever mm -hmm. but but what 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 would help was it you know was it an understanding of was it a network that you had was it a mentor what 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 was in there uh yeah so much really yeah networks are incredibly important so like um I guess prior to moving to London and join Entrepreneur First, like, so on the MN course, we kind of, uh, we'd read case studies about venture capitalists and companies starting and raising money. And this idea of a VC or a venture capitalist was so kind of uh, arbitrary. It was like, who are these people? They kind of sit in their ivory towers in an office. And I didn't really know what they were or how that, how it operates and how they do a deal. And, and I guess going into Entrepreneur First it immediately opens up a network and, there's lots of different people you can learn from and um yeah and away you go so i think um yeah networks and and 
basically just putting yourself out there to learn and absorb as much as you possibly can from all the different people is so incredibly important um, in, on that journey. Did you have did, did you have a specific mentor during your journey over the last 10 years? Uh, in earnest, probably not a specific, no, not really, not a specific mentor. But what I have done is I've at different times managed to, to get so much from so many different people. Um, whether it's like a huge variety of people in Manchester were massively helpful on my journey and in Entrepreneur First, like the, the CEO, Matt Clifford, is super helpful. We've had, we've got some amazing investors, like the former CEO of Just Eat, the former chief co chief commercial officer from Just Eat, got some VCs like um, Forward Partners or 500 Startups. Again, there's people, all these people at, at different times have been so helpful and they've all got their little areas of kind of expertise or insights or networks that you kind of tap in. So I've never really relied on like a go-to mentor. It's just a case of, okay, what, what do we need here? Or what, what would be helpful here? Okay. Let's reach out to this person. And um, yeah, I just had a call the other day, actually, for example, with one of our investors, he used to manage um, a massive hedge fund. It's like billions of pounds and did a lot of angel investing as well. He's left the hedge fund since and, uh, he's getting involved with doing more angel investing, but also, um, um, yeah, and, and, and I had a conversation with him the other day around um, we've had some like, inbound interest on the kind of um, uh, front from some big corporates. I just try to watch my words here so I don't say anything. Yeah, we had no, some big absolutely. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he, he's basically, throughout his career, he's he's worked with massive corporations who've then invested huge sums of money in other companies and acquired other companies and he's just got that that expertise so for for a couple of things going on with us like just kind of conversations but just his prior experience was incredibly valuable just to to tap into and there's there's different people who are incredibly helpful for different things yeah no i think i think you're absolutely right I, there isn't just one person ever but it, it's it's the importance of networks the importance of building up you know the people that um, you know and engage with um, and just making sure that you maintain some of those connections they're incredibly valuable as you as you go forward Absolutely. if you were Andrew if you were starting out again what would you do differently and do not say you wouldn't do the MN all right that, that's, <laughs> that's not allowed all right that answer is not allowed what I'm would definitely... you do differently if you were starting out again uh, that's a really uh that's a really that's a tricky question, question I know um... <laughs> I'd definitely do the MN. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd do it a, a second time. Um, to be honest, I, I don't know. Um, we've, we've tried and tested a lot as we've gone, and I think we've got to a really good spot with the business um, that we're happy with. Yeah, okay, there's probably one thing I would I would have done differently, and, and that was when we were started to sort of scale as a business, probably put a lot more emphasis on hiring for culture and culture fit and, and not just performance. Um, I think, yeah, when you're kind of starting out as a founder, everything's new and you're kind of just testing as you go and trying to find your way. And yeah, what I think one area where it's been quite challenging at times is like trying to understand what is a good fit for our team. Now, up to 10 people, it's relatively easy. Beyond 10 people, it starts to get a bit more challenging. Um, and yeah, I don't think we necessarily put enough emphasis on hiring like for culture fit and it was all about performance. So my, my, um, my advice would be when you're looking, whether it's for a co-founder or new people to start your team, like look at their look at their values, look at how they will fit in with the team. Because it, again, as going back to my point earlier, when you have a co-founder, it's almost like a marriage just without all the extra bits. So you need to make sure that you you can spend a lot of time with that person and and those different people, and you want to spend time with them. And if you, it's quite easy to be like, oh wow, this person is like really smart, or like you know, they've done all this stuff. Like you know, let's. Just, get them into the team and but if they don't gel with the team that could be really really detrimental so one bit of advice would be yeah really really pay attention to culture and values of the different people you work with on your journey 
Yeah, no, I'm really, really pleased you said that. I, I mean, I don't think you you would remember. I mean, I think it was since you were on the program, but we did have one of our immense students again, who's taken a, their, their business forward, has all, all been about, you know, culture fit, all been about people in organisations. And, and I often say that, you know, in business, it's all about the people. You know, the ideas come from the people and you have to have people who can help you drive it forward. You know, it doesn't happen. It's, you know, you know, it doesn't just happen by me writing a list of things that need to take place, but find people who are able to um, take them forward and deliver on those. So, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with what you say. Um, so what, what, what are your recommendations then for the for, I'm going to look I'm going to look for questions from the audience in a minute, um, Andrew. But what, what 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 are your recommendations? for the next generation of entrepreneurs? Well, uh, what are my recommendations for them? Um, do the MN. <laughs> um, <laughs> read the Lean Startup. Absolutely read the Lean Startup. Um, yeah, there's some incredible books out there that I would definitely recommend reading, like the Lean Startup. Um, what about the hard or, thing about hard things? Yeah, hard thing about hard things is a great one. Um, Peter, Peter Thiel, zero to one. Yeah, exactly. That's another one. You're, you're, yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember. I've, yeah, I've got plenty of other books. Um, the CEO Handbook. I was, I, one of our VCs gave me for Christmas, which is a really great practical book. Um, yeah, read lots. Um, I give it a try. I mean, I know, I know. I was kind of saying before when you kind of, you know, it's a big commitment, but. There's, there's, there's absolutely zero harm in terms of having lifestyle businesses that don't have to, you don't have to do for five or 10 years, but you can just learn so much from doing and you can do it on a, on a shoestring in a lot of cases. So yeah, learn by doing, read lots. And um, and if you really think you can do it and go for it, then you know, real, like with a particular idea, realize it's, it's a big commitment. Um, yeah. 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 But, but, but it is great, isn't it, to find, it's like you find that sweet spot um, of, of life, which is, you know, you find something you're good at and uh, something that people want, <laughs> but mm. also people will pay you for it. And, and, and almost it's not, it's not really, you know, work-life balance. It's really about work-life integration. I mean, do you see that happens with you, Andrew, that, you know, your, your work and your life are really integrated? So, you know, you don't, I'm presuming you don't feel stressed because you will end up working 24 seven and seven days a week. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in terms of, yeah, I think it is. Yeah. It's, um, it's definitely a lifestyle choice insofar as it's not, especially in the early days, it's not going to be nine to five. If you want to make it a, a, a success, it's definitely more than that. I think as it gets to a certain level and it gets more mature and it's more stable, then you can, pick and choose your work patterns you could work nine to five if you wanted um which i've kind of i've gone through a phase in the past where i've had to kind of set boundaries like where like okay when i leave the office i'm not going to check my email i'm just that's it uh but then i've had other, experimented with other work patterns now with having a um we're more remote and i've got a young son i'm a little bit more flexible so i might in the day spend a bit more time doing stuff with him but then I might work in the evenings and yeah. so um yeah I think it's you have to find a, a pattern that's going to work for you your business your life and and uh obviously the ultimately end of the day the most important thing is yeah well-being right so um you know yeah. you can you can be a an entrepreneur doing great stuff but if your mental health is is taking a hit and you're not you're not happy then it is you know sometimes it might be phases like that but if it's prolonged it's absolutely not worth it um so yeah it's always worth bearing these things in mind yeah no i i absolutely agree which is why i think it's so important you find something that you're going to love um because then you know that 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 naturally takes away the pressures um be, because you love what you do it's almost it you know you're almost doing it it's almost a, a kind of a hobby almost as opposed to just being about a, about work and it's a it's a really nice place to be um, because we're all going to have to work a lot longer than perhaps we had anticipated. Um, so, Andrew, when you when you say that, you know, you're looking at the next 50, 100 years of click mechanic, I mean, you know, you're probably looking at the next 50, 100 years of Andrew Jervis as well, as we all live longer and we're all more healthy. Um, so, yeah, you have to find things you want to do. So, 
Andrew, is there a is there a second business that's going to come out of Andrew Jervis over the next, you know, in the next 10, 20 years? Is there going to be something else that you might be looking to do? Maybe moving back into clothing or fashion? Who knows? What do you think? Uh, yeah, possibly. Yeah, I've done. I've started doing a little bit of uh, angel investing on the side. So I've invested in a few different businesses as well, which is really fun. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there's probably uh, at the minute it's very much focused on clip mechanic and and taking that to the, ne the next level. But yeah, absolutely, I think there could be um, you know another another exciting um, yeah business in there as well as supporting other companies and and maybe something that can have a you know a great a really positive impact on on the planet and what's happening um, could be really interesting. I've got a few ideas around that, but the minute we're yeah we're certainly focused on what we're doing with Click Mechanic. Uh, it's fantastic to hear that. I'm, I'm, I think you're very inspirational, Andrew, and I'm, 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 so, I'm so pleased that, um, you know, I can call you, a, you know, hopefully I can call you a friend as well as a previous student. And uh, there are a couple of questions uh, from the audience. So let, let me throw these into you. Um, I think there'll be a lot nicer questions than I've asked. <laughs> Go for it. So, uh, one of the questions is, it was great to see that you were awarded the Startup Entrepreneur of the Year especially during that we've been through a really difficult time through the pandemic. Um, do you have any tips on resilience through tough times? Yeah, great, great question. Um, I think self-care is incredibly important. Um, so, yeah, making sure that you uh, create rituals or habits or uh, a working environment um, or just a, a home environment that, that's that's good for you and, and works for you. Um, yeah, I mean, at Clip Mechanic, we we introduced a program um, called Spill. So basically anybody at any point can um, book in a, a call with a, a, a professional, like a, a psychologist or a therapist uh, and get that support or ask a question. Um, so it's something we're like very, we regularly send surveys out to the team, like how they're feeling, what's, what's working, what's not. And I think, you know, making sure that you're, you're looking after you and, and, and providing what you need to yourself is, is incredibly important because then if you're looking after yourself and you're in a good, good headspace and you're feeling good, you'll be able to offer more to everyone else. So, um, yeah, that, that would be, uh, yeah, especially over the last two years, that would be incredibly important, I think. Yeah, it's something no, I've thanks. realized as well. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, Andrew, the, 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 there's another question again, which comes back to this uh, this um, aspect of networks. Um, what support network did you have while you were developing your business? And you know, if you can, can you help advise someone on the sort of tools people can use to build build their networks? Yeah, yeah, I think um, I think it's. Like in terms of like what tools you can use to build your network, I think I really feel it's like about just putting yourself out there. Um, so I know when I moved to Manchester, I didn't know anyone there and went down to the Freshers Fair and had a look at everything. I was like, the Entrepreneur Society sounds cool. And then it was like, chat, chat to those guys. When's your next meeting? OK, I'll come along to that. And then chat to people, get to know them. And uh, if there was talks going on like uh, like this or whatever it is at the university, sign up to it, go along hang around after chat to people get you know it's just about building a network and often it, it happens from scratch and you know the more you invest into that the more opportunities will, be, will come about because the only reason I joined Entrepreneur First uh, was because um, yeah I was uh, vice president of Manchester Entrepreneurs and they got in touch to wanted to do a talk and we used to get this a lot and so uh, I went along to open up the the, uh, the lecture theatre and sat in. I was like, wow, this sounds awesome. So I was like, I'll apply for that. And obviously, if I going back to the Freshers Fair, if I hadn't gone to the Freshers Fair, I hadn't gone up to the stand and spoke to the guys. If I hadn't gone to my first event, if I hadn't been asked to be vice president, I wouldn't have, you know, uh, applied to Entrepreneur first and wouldn't have got there and that wouldn't have opened up other networks. So I don't think it's a case of like adding loads of people on LinkedIn or anything like that. It's a case of, yeah, getting, especially in the early days, getting out there and just, putting yourself out there really that would be yeah that would be my yeah advice. I, I think I think that's a, re a, re a really good good point and and also um it's that kind of natural curiosity isn't it um which helps 
if you want to be an opportunity spotter um, mm. and you want to be able to build your network, it's about having um, that, you know, that ability, you know, still being curious and being interested in things. Um, and, and I think also never being afraid to ask questions um, of people. Um, you know, 100%. sometimes you think, you know, you feel, oh, oh, they're going to think I'm really stupid if I ask that question. But that's not the case at all, is it? No, no. And it, it, I guess it kind of pulls down to this other other point I was making earlier, like make sure you surround yourself with you know, people who share the same values or the same culture. And if you're doing that and and, and joining those groups and that, that people won't you know, say that's a silly question, they'll be, you know, you'll, you'll search, share the same values and you'll help each other and it'll yeah. be a good question. And yeah, I'm, yeah, there's, there's no, no such thing as a silly question. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay, so I'm just gonna take the last couple of questions now. Um, so in your early startup days, um, what was the best use of the funds you, you received? And maybe the worst. So the best use of funds and the worst. Uh, best use of funds was uh, basically to prolong runway. So they talk about runway, which is like how long you can keep going for before you run out of cash and, and just making sure you use money to stay in the game, basically, um, because there is a finite, you know, it's, it was a finite about cash resource and, and when that's gone, it's gone and you have to go and get a job. So we used to, uh, when I first moved down to London and uh, sleep on a friend's couch, yeah, we, we knew when Tesco would um, always put the display, uh, dis discounted food out and, and uh, by getting uh, you know, some cheap food, it would, it would keep those reserves going and, and we could spend more time investing in the business and, and keep trying to figure it out and using those build, measure, learn loops from the lean startup and try and get somewhere. So I think the best use of money was just like being really frivolous with it and and using it sparingly to keep us to keep us going. There's a saying called cockroach startups and they're startups which just don't die. Um, so we were probably the epitome of that. Worst use of money was um, uh to be honest so it's just really frugal so I, I can't i can't think of anything that i think i shouldn't have done that because again as i mentioned earlier we yeah we just put our money to to real like hard work and and, yeah. and use in the early days did, did you um you know thinking about staffing um how did you source people in the early days when you haven't got much money and you can't employ people um did you outsource tasks did you um did you have to find that a way of um of getting additional resource or did you not move into that area of outsourcing uh we did a little bit of outsourcing not not a great deal i mean to be honest our we we hired interns to be honest who were um yeah our, our first two employees who we hired one at the end of 2013 and one at the end of 2014 there were interns on intern salaries it wasn't much but it was it, it helped them get by we didn't have much money but um as soon as we could be able to kind of pay them more and more we did but um they were you know yeah they were that's how we went about it and those two guys are still with us today one leads our marketing one leads our product and they're they've been with us like what's that eight years now and they're, they're you know when you talk about culture and values and all that sort of stuff those guys completely epitomize what we're about and they're they're doing an awesome job and um yeah that's yeah we did a little bit of outsourcing and use stuff like Upwork where you can get people in countries whose cost of living might be considerably lower and they will do work uh, at a considerably lower rate and we had some success with that um, but most of it was just rolling up our sleeves and working seven days a week and trying to get money in and some investment that we could hire people. Yeah and, and, and also I'm really pleased you mentioned interns I mean they were two really lucky interns I mean, you know, taking a role as an intern is a real opportunity. It really opens opportunities if you if you make the most of it. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. if you if if you you know if you work hard and you you know you really get the same values as the organisation you're interning with. You know, you really can you know develop a role that then grows and grows just as it has done with the with the two interns that joined your organisation. A hundred and ten percent. Yeah, it's been. We have a lot of people. We, we're pretty um we have a lot of people who've come and joined us as like customer service um entry level customer service and they've kind of progressed through the company um we have a lot of people like that who've been with us for quite some time or people who've done interns as well 
uh, internships who at the end of it, we've been like, wow, they, they did awesome. They really seized our opportunity and we offered them a full-time role. Um, you know, equally, there has been people who've come in who haven't quite seized those opportunities, but um, yeah, probably the, the culture fit with Clint Mechanic and them was, was not quite right for whatever reason, or maybe they weren't into cars or whatever. But um, yeah, we, we're very lucky to have you know, the team we've got now, uh, you know, a great, great bunch, and we all align really well on the culture values. And a lot of them have earned those, earned those opportunities that have come their way uh, just through doing a great job. Uh, Andrew, um, I think our time is is now at an end for this session today. But I really, I really want to thank you so much for taking the time um, to um, to talk to me today and to share your thoughts with this, you know, wider audience. Um, it was incredibly inspiring. Um, I'm amazed um, because actually uh, there is no real secret sauce, is there? In, in a way, in a way, um, you could say it's it's really simple and really straightforward. Um, it's not complicated, um, but it just takes a particular mindset. It takes an entrepreneurial mindset to really take those ideas and uh, and move them forward as um, as successful ideas um, and, and make them have a life, um, a life, a long life, which I hope Click Mechanic has, along with Andrew Jervis and Felix and the rest of your team. So Andrew, thank you so much um, for the time today. Um, I hope to see you again soon back in Manchester to come and revisit um, the Entrepreneurship Centre here at Manchester and uh, look at where you spent some quite interesting times of your life walking down Oxford Road um, with a guitar. Um, but uh, to the rest of the audience uh, that are joining us, can I just remind you to please connect with us here at the Masood Entrepreneurship Centre and look out for other events that are planned throughout the year. You know, we have a range of programs to encourage you to become more entrepreneurial. Um, we do have a new postgraduate online, uh, postgraduate certificate. It's an online global program in entrepreneurship that we're launching in September this year. And so please, if you're interested, do look out for that. Um, but if you already have a venture in mind, then think about entering venture further. Um, that's exactly what uh, Andrew did. Um, and please like and follow us across all our social media platforms. And we hope to see you again at our future events. Um, thank you very much um, to everyone. Thank you very much to Andrew and, and good night. <laughs>